Thank you very much for being here today uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, so I really, uh, we really appreciate it. And um, so we're going to start with uh, with a blessing. And uh, I ask Elmer if he would uh, give the blessing this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Elder. <laughs> Good morning, elders. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, other elected leaders and uh, guests and the, uh, the staff and all the young Métis academics. Uh, uh, what a great job they're doing. I would like to uh, say a prayer for blessing this morning um, for us to continue on with uh, this just tremendous, timely needed uh, dialogue about the Daniels uh, case and the impact and the meaning it has on, on Métis and probably uh, government as well. <clears throat> so with that, I'll, I'll say it in uh, Bushland Cree. Mamuin <laughs> Sagatihiak, Timuat Muyak, the Bahpiak. You go on, ma Pitama. Hi, hi. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> Adam, where are your. <laughs> So I guess uh, we'll call the <laughs> the panelists to come here, please. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our first panel on our, our final day. Uh, this panel is entitled All My Relations, Identity and Indigeneity, and it's going to be exploring the kind of uh, the many ways uh, in which we relate to one another um, and which we uh, define ourselves. Uh, so we've got four. Um, quite accomplished speakers here. Um, the, the first up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Rob Innes, uh, who is a member of Cowessis First Nation and an associate professor in the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he will be presenting on kinship versus race, re reconciling Métis First Nations historical relationships. Uh, please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Rob Innes. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank the organizers, Natalie and, and Chantel, for all the hard work they've done uh, organizing uh, this and somehow getting me here. So I'm not sure they must have worked extra hard for that. To make, um, uh, mainly because I don't usually don't know where I am half the time. So. Um, <clears throat> This research is, is or this uh, talk is, is uh, based on my dissertation research that I did. Um, I was looking at uh, exploring uh, uh, kinship patterns of contemporary Kaos's members. And one of the things that uh, I was looking at is, uh, you know, when you're, when you do the historiography of uh, Indigenous people in Saskatchewan, uh, you, you will find uh, a lot of histories that are specific to Cree, to Soto, to Cinnaboyan, to Métis, and yet none of that really, none of those histories really reflected the realities of Kaos's because Kaos's and uh, members and uh, ha were come from all those four groups, and so one of the questions I asked when I was doing the research is, uh, 
Well, how was it that the Métis were, were members of Kawasis in pre-reserved time? And so, uh, and this is what, this is partially the, uh, was you know, the answer to that. So, uh, scholars have, for, have gone to great lengths to emphasize the, the differences and tensions between Métis and First Nations. The differences are said to be due to the fact that uh, Métis are racially and culturally distinct from First Nations. Colonial mechanisms employed racialized notions of Métis that created a distance of any cultural similarities they had with First Nations so effectively that many indigenous people, to varying degrees, have internalized that fiction. Scholars, politicians, and others have struggled to explain the existence of a mixed race people, applying race as a starting point for their explanation. According to Brenda Mc, uh, McDougall, quote, <laughs> Canadian scholars like American count their American count counterparts have been overly and unproductively preoccupied with race at the expense of culture, end quote when it comes to discussions about Métis people. Yet race was not applied to First Nations in the same way, even though many were also of mixed white and indigenous ancestry and integrated various cultural, European cultural practices. One result of the internalizations of these racial, racial notions has been a determination by Métis and First Nation political organizations and individuals to draw hard cultural boundaries to highlight the distinction between them. In this presentation, I show that the emphasis on the racial component of Métis and the tension between uh, them and First Nation groups belies the fact that these groups share many cultural characteristics such as kinship. Uh, Métis people are indigenous, not because, not only because uh, of the inherited ancestral lineages uh, from First Nations, but also because of their shared cultural practices. An example of the uh, tensions that scholars have looked at include the way in which Plains Cree, the Plains Cree, Assiniboine, and Soto felt about Métis buffalo hunting practices. Though there is evidence of their dissatisfaction, it is interesting that uh, the kind of evidence scholars cite detailing how First Nations dealt with uh, the issue. Evidence shows, the evidence shows that First Nations uh, attempted to settle the situation by expressing their concerns to fur traders, keeping Métis under surveillance, subjecting them to annoyances, or lighting prairie fires. Considering the central importance of the buffalo to their economic, to their own economic, social, and spiritual well-being, it's surprising that there are no accounts of the Plains Cree, Assiniboine, or Soto waging war on the Métis. That the that these uh, First Nations fought many battles against other First Nations is well documented, although. Uh, uh, although there may be references of tensions between the Plains Cree, Soto, and Sonoboyne with the Métis, there are no actual count of any battles. The, this suggests that the Plains Cree, Sonoboyne, and Soto treated the Métis differently than, say, how they treated the Blackfoot, where stolen horses could spark violent responses. The tensions, the level of tensions, tension and the different treatment vis-a-vis -vis other indigenous group between the Plains Cree and Sinoboan, Soto, and Métis has been glossed over by scholars whose work has unjustifiably emphasized the differences between First Nations and Métis. Any tension that occurred between Métis bands and the uh, bands of, the, uh, of these other groups uh, does, not appear, it does not appear to have been any more significant than tensions that occurred between uh, uh, that occurred between the bands of these First Nations. The, the fact that no evidence of actual conflict exists points to the level of relationship the Métis had with these other, first, uh, with these other groups. The lack of uh, warfare is due to the kinship ties between the groups. The close relationship between First Nations and Métis is highlighted by, degree, by the degree of intermarriage. For example, Palmaker's mother is reported to have been Métis. Little, Chief Littlebone, or Michael Cardinal, was of Soto Métis ancestry, 
and had many wives who were either Soto or Meti or both. Chief Gabriel Cody, or the Pigeon, was the son of a Soto mother and a Metis man. Heather Devine suggests that Chief Callas's may have been Marcel Desjardins, who was a, of Soto and Metis ancestry. The father of another Callas's chief, Louis Osoup, was Michael Cardinal. Uh, in addition, the close relations uh, and similar culture features between uh, the Metis and the, and the Plains Korean Assiniboine and Soto is also is illustrated by, both by the fact that many bands contain Métis members as well as the chiefs' uh, desires to have Métis included in treaties. During Treaty 4 negotiations in 1874, for example, Chief Cam uh, Camosus, also spelled Canusus, requested that the Métis be included in treaty. Two, two years later, in Treaty 6 negotiation, uh, Chief Mr. Wassis also requested that his uh, Métis relatives be included in treaty. In 1881, in, in the Cypress Hills, Chief Lucky Man and Little Pine made similar requests. That same year, the Governor General uh, visited the Northwest Territories and met with First Nations leaders. The spokesperson for the, for the First Nations uh, chiefs uh, also uh, made the, the request that the, that the Métis be included in treaty. Even after the government refused to enter into treaty negotiations with the Métis, many simply jo joined their relatives in bands that had already been recognized as Indians. Although the Métis had developed a separate culture, it contained enough common points that they were able to marry into these bands without any significant uh, disruption to either group. Nicole St. Ange uh, research has shown that scholars have overlooked Métis Soto uh, relations during the uh, mid 19th century in, uh, in St. Paul, uh, so Paul de Soto in the Red River, uh, uh, River colonies. According to St. Ange, since the 1980s, scholars have argued that one of the central components of uh, components to making the Métis a people was their high level of endogamy. However, her examination of church, rec church and sessions records showed that, in fact, there was a high level, high rate of intermarriage between the Soto and the Métis. The notion of Métis endogamy uh, uh, emphasizes cultural differences between the Métis and Soto and other First Nations groups. However, uh, as St. Orange points out, the intermixing of these two groups, quote, indicates that prior to 1870, ethnic identities were fluid, relational, and situational, end quote. The Métis and Soto shared significant uh, cultural uh, practices allow for the incorporation of new members. Uh, St. Orange states that, quote, if mechanisms existed in both Métis and Soto communities to incorporate European outsiders into their extensive family networks, it, is, it, it, it was all the easier for people already closely uh, allied to merge with, other, with either or both communities uh, as circumstances uh, dictated, end quote. Scholars have simply not recognized that the Métis and Soto, as well as the Plain Koreans and Songboin, shared similar cultural kinship understandings. The close relationship uh, continued into the 20th century. Here I point to some brief examples that I discussed in my research on kinship practices among members of Kaos' First Nation that show the relationship between Kaos' people and the Métis community of Maryville. The two communities took part in many social activities, community dances, they played baseball, attended the same uh, church located on the, on the reserve. In fact, uh, uh, many Métis, uh, Maryville Métis people are buried in the Kaos' cemetery. M many marriages between the communities continued into at least the mid-century uh, mid when uh, Mervo was, uh, uh, people in Mervo were relocated. There's at least one account of a Kaosus mar man marrying a Métis woman, then took script, then later he, his wife, and children 
went back into Scrip, though the government withheld his uh, annuities, and, of his annuities and his, and his wife's annuities and his children's annuities until the script was uh, paid back. In another case, a uh woman married a Métis man from Maryville had lost her status but regained it through Bill C-31. Her husband also regained his status as his mom too was from Kawasas. So there were two generations of Kawasas people who had married into, and, and, and this was uh, fairly common with, uh, with uh, people on Kawasas. Her husband um, her also regained, uh, oh, <laughs> where am I? Oh, there I am. Uh, my own grandfather, Samson Pelcher, who was you know, from Kalasas, also married uh, a woman from Maryville, my grandmother, Rose Agath Pelcher. These, uh, these uh, uh, continued relationships would not have happened if they had not had shared cultural understandings. Scholars' determination to highlight the cultural differences between First Nations and Métis people have cl clouded their ability to see the cultural similarities. The, that, tendencies ha, that tendency has been fueled by an implicitly racial, a racial view of these groups. There can be little doubt that the presence of, Métis, of the Métis has added a, a, a certain uh, complexity to understanding uh, intra-Indigenous relations. The, this complexity has been due in no small part to outsiders' attempt attempts to understand the impact of the racial makeup of the Métis. The notion of race is still embedded in discussions about Métis people. For example, Métis are frequently described as cultural brokers, cultural mediators, bicultural, because of their ability to straddle First Nation and European cultures. However, First Nations are also cultural brokers, cultural mediators, and were bicultural and even multicultural. And, uh, and, uh, and they accumulate, uh, uh, acculturated themselves to various uh, practices, uh, European practices, and um, wait a second, I, I skipped something again. Okay, we're multi and even multicultural, and then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there, there, were, there were many First Nations people and groups who, to varying degrees, acculturated them themselves to uh, various European practices and values. These individuals or communities, however, have not usually been viewed as cultural mediators in the same way as Métis, nor have they been seen as any less First Nation for adapting or, and or adopting European cultures or for being of mixed ancestry. Many historians have emphasized the Europeanness of the Métis while ignoring their indigeneity, uh, reinforcing the, idea, the idea of Métis as racially and culturally distinct from First Nations. McDougall points out in her work the role uh, uh, her, in her work um, uh, the, uh, in her work the role that women play played in the creation and maintenance of the Métis as a people. By doing so, McDougall not only challenges the significance given to European men for passing on their Europeanness in the process of Métis ethnogenesis, but she also sheds light onto the importance that First Nations cultural practices, as transmitted by women, had in Métis cultural development. The weight given to Métis Europeanness has unfairly overshadowed First Nations culture in the emerging uh, Métis culture. For some scholars and others, if Métis people live too much like Indians, then they could not be Métis. In other words, they were too Indian and not white enough to be Métis. A key component then to Métis is not simply about the level of racial mixture of Europeans. If that were the case, the talk would not be about whether or not folks in Eastern Canada are Métis, the, but whether or not the Cree are Métis. Right. That, um, perhaps uh, interesting. I, I'm sorry. Perhaps instead of exploring how First Nation, uh, how Métis European, and therefore, uh, sorry, how Métis are European, and therefore different than First Nation, but rather how Métis share similar cultural char characteristics with First Nations. What is key, however, is that Métis and First Nations shared 
uh, cultural practices uh, were sustained through ongoing, meaningful interaction, even though the, those relational interactions were more rocky in some times uh, than smooth in, in some cases. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And for those of you who are interested in, in learning a little bit more about Rob's uh, work on First Nations Métis relations, I would recommend his book, Elder Brother and the Law of the People from the University of Manitoba Press. It's a great resource on this. It's been, I think, quite impactful for a lot of us. Um, it's, a, it's a good read. Um, so next up, we have Harold Robinson, uh, who was admitted to the Alberta Law Society in 1994. Uh, Harold is a Métis lawyer and a mediator from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, as well as the Tribunal Secretary slash Director for the Métis Settlements Appeal Tribunal. Um, he's also on the National Roger Roster of Mediators for the Canadian Human Rights Commission. A lifelong learner, Harold recently completed uh, driving government performance at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Um, he's married and has two sons, and his summers are spent camping and winters spent trying not to fall over while skiing. Um, could you please join me in welcoming uh, Harold Robinson? Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me. Um, it really is uh, wonderful to uh, be here. It's, uh, it feels like a bit of a homecoming when I see uh, uh, Elmer and uh, Muriel and others. Uh, it really is a nice, warm feeling. Um, I'm going to uh, start by apologizing to the uh, organizers. What I was asked to do is different than what I actually did. Um, <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about being this urbane Métis guy and how that relates to identity. But what I end up uh, writing about uh, is about being a dad and about um, uh, uh, having just finished 12 years of adjudicating residential school uh, claims as I reflected on the meaning of Daniels. On Tuesday, uh, I got this email from my son, Sam, who was here yesterday uh, for a little bit. It, it reads this. Uh, Hi, Dad. I just found out about a social assignment I must have been away for. Luckily, all I have to do is make five questions about your culture and identity and how they have changed over the past 20 years. So here they are. How do you feel as a And by the way, this is about 9 o'clock that I got this. And he said it has to be done by 12. And my wife said, no, it's got to be done by 10 because he's got to go to bed. <laughs> so and these five questions. Uh, and so the first one is, how do you feel as a Métis your culture has changed over the past 20 years? So here's my response. Uh, thanks for these questions, Sam. Firstly, my culture is your culture. <laughs> you are Métis. Uh, you are also of German ethnicity. Ultimately, you are Canadian. Métis Canadian, German Canadian, Canadian Canadian. In my opinion, culture is not something that changes much. Being Métis means the same thing now as it did to me growing up. It means taking pride in being part of a very special group of people who helped build Canada. Métis were instrumental to the fur trade as a group of people who helped, oh, sorry, as traders, trappers, and voyagers. Métis negotiated the inclusion of Manitoba in Confederation, but really, Métis is about being industrious and generous at the same time. It's about being a good listener and respecting elders and others around you. It's about feeling a special tie to the land, water, and the air we breathe. It's also about standing up for rights when necessary, but firstly, being interested in partnership. Question two, do you feel this has benefited your personality, your personal identity, and why? Yes. I feel the world, I view the world around me uh, through many different lenses. One of those lenses is my culture. I question how Métis people were treated in the past and how today's laws and practices affect Métis people. It's the reason I became a lawyer, to help Métis people get ahead. Fortunately, the work I do during the day helping the Métis Settlements of Alberta run their court system complements my desire to promote Métis culture and identity and to strengthen Métis self-governance. Also, my work as a panelist with the Belcourt Brasso Métis Awards is immensely satisfying because with each scholarship we give out, another Métis is well on his or her way to realizing their full potential. Question three. Do you think that your culture is being better recognized over uh, the past 20 years? Yes. There's now an Aboriginal Day, June 21st, and Métis Week in November. 
of each year. There have also been some important court cases out of the Supreme Court, Powley, Cunningham, and Daniels, that provide useful frameworks to discuss Métis culture rights and responsibilities and opportunities for reconciliation. There's also a number of conferences about Métis rights and history, including one this weekend at the University of Alberta called Daniels in and beyond the law. I will be talking at it about future agenda items for Métis and Canada to talk about. You should come. Which his response was, do I have to? <laughs> so I made him come yesterday. <laughs> Question four, how have the roles of your culture changed? That's my response. My granny, your great-grandma, Maria Plews, lived in Anzac. She trapped rabbits, tanned uh, hides, and sewed the most beautiful moccasins with flower patterns on them. My mother, June, raised four children on her own. She worked two jobs to do so. My older sister, Kim, was the first to go to university. As far as I can tell, Métis women are leaders at work, at school, and at home. I do not know that this has changed. And for my part, as a Métis man, I just try and keep up with the women. Question five, do you feel the community of your culture uh, has strengthened or weakened and why? So it depends what indicator you look at. If language is the key indicator, my mother and granny spoke Cree, but I do not. I think it has something to do with the fact that my mother, your grandmother, went to residential school for a while and was punished for speaking Cree and did not want to teach her kids a language for which they would be punished. That said, I think there are many other indicators, though, such as pride of culture, affinity with core principles, and self-identification as Métis, when amongst others, that are all heading in a positive direction. That, that said, Métis culture, your culture, must continuously be safeguarded and nurtured. When you tell people you are Métis, you are strengthening the culture by opening yourself up to others who are Métis and to those who are interested in learning more about it, even as you learn about it. So thanks again for the great question, Sam. So that's my reflection on identity. Now, here's what I was asked to do in terms of writing the paper. And what I ended up doing was recommending a, um, a series of agenda items based on my understanding of, of Daniels. And when you read Daniels, uh, uh, and, and the Supreme Court decision in particular, it's interesting to me that it, it opens like a play. From the first line, we're invited to imagine the curtain opening on the history of Canada's relationship with its indigenous people in which inequities are increasingly revealed and remedies urgently sought. We are told that despite some good faith policy and legislative responses, the list of disadvantages remains robust. The narrator then tells us that what this play offers is a critical commentary on the pursuit of reconciliation and redress in Canada's relationship with Métis people. By granting the first declaration that Métis fall under the federal head of power, Section 9124 of the British North America Act, the Supreme Court reunites Canada and Métis people with one another. In their view, this is the first step towards reconciliation. By not granting the second and third declarations on the grounds that a fiduciary duty already exists and that the right to be consulted and negotiated is part and parcel of the reunion, the Supreme Court signals that redress is possible but will come later. It will come through dialogue focused on matters of practical utility and future partnerships that grow out of that dialogue. It is not a reunion without its challenges, though, because the court's rationale for reconciling Canada and Métis people with one another is that from the very beginning, Canada has abused Métis as if they were Indians. In this regard, it's a bit like Stockholm Syndrome or reverse Stockholm Syndrome, where the captives uh, develop an affinity for their captors. Only in this case, it's the authorities who pronounce that captive and captor must stay together. It's a little bit like if they could have called it, you break it, you bought it, uh, they would have. <laughs> In any event, this reunion is called reconciliation. That the Supreme Court recognizes the strained nature of the relationship is evident in its characterization of the Canada-Métis origin story as one of abuse, capped off by the application of the residential school program to Métis. The Supreme Court also recognizes that true reconciliation redress lies in other processes, including those named in the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <laughs> 
This characterization and admonishment by the court combined with statistics, which we are all too familiar, and which Métis fall behind non-Aboriginal uh, non Canadians on practically every social and economic measure, and that First Nations fall behind Métis, should be a warning to all that past involvement by Canada has yielded poor returns. Accordingly, when asking for Canada's help, the request must be strategic, practical, and tied to specific outcomes. In this regard, the purpose of this paper then is to recommend agenda items for consideration by the parties. And I recommend four agenda items using two guiding principles. Three of these uh, agenda items are harm reduction strategies. Uh, and the last one is a growth strategy. So the guiding principles is that all three uh, orders of court said that the application of Daniels must have practical utility. Uh, the second guiding principle is that reconciliation and redress involves dialogue and partnership, healing wounds, and maximizing potential. So where do you start? I think you start with healing. Healing is what is needed, first, because one cannot run a marathon unless one is strong in mind, body, and spirit. What's coming up is a marathon. Healing is not just a matter of convenience, it's the quintessence of practical utility. Without healing and the sure footing it brings, new programs and partnerships will want for traction and will ultimately strain to deliver measurable improvements. How many times have you heard, we don't want to throw more money at the problem? Uh, I think what that is saying is to the extent that money has gone into programs and services in the past and we haven't seen the outcomes expected, our wheels have been spinning. Now the next question that should have been asked is why? Uh, in my view, what needs healing, uh, the, question, the, the, the answer to the question, what, so what needs healing, uh, the answer is the devastating impacts from the 100 plus years of residential school uh, need healing because the legacy of that multi-generational program touches every single Aboriginal person alive today. I say that all Aboriginal people are affected because of the residential school program because it was built on a breach of the universal right of families not to be separated by the state. And that right is enshrined in Article 16.3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, 1948. Article 16 reads, and there's a paper that I've handed out, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. So whether one escaped physical or sexual abuse at residential school, every parent who was left behind and every child who was taken from their home was robbed of critical rights to teach and learn and love and protect one another, and is left with the ugly scars of abuse that are inevitable when families are separated by the state for generation after generation. In a way, it's almost bred in the bone. This is now part of our culture. We have to deal with this. So my first recommendation then in terms of an agenda item is the establishment of Centers for Reconciliation. Now I put a, a proposal together which is on your tables and uh, first uh, floated it with the government of Alberta a couple years ago. And I'm still waiting for uh, a definitive response. I've had a couple meetings with the minister and probably could have done a better job of uh, convincing him that this would be something useful. Uh, so what I'm looking for now, and the reason I put this on the table, is I suspect that there are people in the room with some real stroke and with some real capacity to do a better job than I did. And if you think there's something to this proposal, I would invite you, on behalf of your families, on behalf of your mothers and your grannies and your kids, to look at the proposal, and if you think it's a good idea, maybe tell the minister so. So that's proposal uh, uh, agenda item number one. And it corresponds with call to action number 57 in the uh, TRC. Agenda item number two is development and implement a Métis specific residential school settlement agreement. This is also found in one of the recommendations of the uh, TRC. And I think the president of the Métis National Council, Clement Charté, uh, spoke about it. And uh, it's in my paper, which I will hand out a little later. And he says some just really intelligent and uh, grounded things about how Métis were affected uh, by the residential school process and how that has not yet been fully addressed by our community. And I think his point is that we should lead those discussions. 
I think we should also, though, having just finished 12 years of adjudicating residential school claims, look at the settlement agreement, look at the independent assessment process, and ask what worked well, what didn't work so well. Here's one hint. Negotiate the years of operation uh, going in. Don't leave any ambiguity around that. Take hold of that. Uh, agenda item number three, and I appreciate I'm, I'm just about out of time here, uh, I, but I did want to talk a little bit about this one, is um, make it awkward. Call out John A. McDonald as a racist. <clears throat> We're heading into 150 years of uh, confederation. We're going to hear all about him for the next year and what a great guy he, he was and how Canada wouldn't be here without him. Here's, here's what I'm going to suggest is make it awkward. It's time for Canada and Métis people to say in unison that the person who founded Canada did so with poison in his heart and vitriol on his lips for all things Aboriginal. And his hatred led to directly to policies and practices meant to eliminate Indigenous culture. Certainly, Canadians should continue to be of the view that there would be no Canada without John A. Macdonald. But they should also be aware that John A. Macdonald wished for a Canada with no recognizable Indian, Métis, or Inuit to speak of. These are his words that he spoke in Parliament in 1883. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with his parents, who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits, training, and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly pressed on myself as the head of the department that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from parental in influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes and thoughts of white men. While some may argue that racism was simply a fact of life in 1883, McDonald's comments aren't just pejorative. They're laced with hostility and hate. Tragically, it's this hostility and hate that underpinned the way in which the residential school programs were run to the point that reports identifying early abuses and intolerable living conditions and outcomes were ignored because those reports suggested that Indigenous students be afforded the same or some elemental right of uh, accorded to all human beings, which didn't correspond with John A. Macdonald's vision of what the school should do. John A. Macdonald's words were likely obnoxious and terrible to those present in 1883, or at least some of those present. Today, his words should be obnoxious and terrible to all of us, without exception. And we should say so. That Canada and Métis leaders are now, should now make it awkward for John A. Macdonald is important because his words are still hurtful. And it's time to appreciate that John the Builder was also John the Hater. And that we can temper the effects of his words and actions through our actions today that put John A. in his place. Last agenda item, uh, I'm going to recommend as a growth strategy that Canada inject $30 million into the Belcourt Parasso Métis Award Scholarship Fund and inject a similar amount or greater amount into the Rupert's Land Institute for, to fund post-secondary studies. The stats couldn't be clearer on this. Métis kids who go to university close that social economic gap like nobody's business. There's even some stats that say if you're Métis and you go to university, chances are you're going to make more than, more, more than non-Métis, uh, than non-Aboriginal students uh, when you finish. You're going to be in demand. You're going to be part of some important discussions. And uh, that's a wonderful opportunity, I think. So that's agenda item one, one, two, three, and four. And I just wanted to uh, finish by saying, you know, as we move forward and this opportunity now to dance with the bear, so to spoke, is now before us. Just remember, it's still a bear. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Harold. Our, our third speaker is Rick Smith, um, who's a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. His research merges molecular biology and social anthropology to explore the entanglements of matter and meaning, uh, the ways that social, political, cultural, and biological forces interact to constitute human bodies and identities, past and present. Rick is interested in the biopolitics of identity, 
and biocolonialism and has ongoing research projects that evaluate the roles of genomics and paleogenomics in constituting very, various aspects of indigenous, white, and queer belonging in the settler state. Uh, Rick's paper is entitled All My Relations, Making Kin and Kindred in a Post-Genomic World. Could you all please join me in welcoming uh, Rick Smith. Okay, I'd like to start by saying thank you all for inviting me here to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground quite quickly in this talk, focusing largely on DNA science and its use within settler claims to indigenous bodies, identities, and cultural patrimony, building on a lot of what Kim Talbert and others have said here. So I'll be speaking from the context of the US here, uh, specifically with regard to notions of tribal belonging as they exist there. But I hope this will open up a variety of issues that are of mutual concern, because as we've seen a lot over the last couple of days, there are parallels between claims to indigenous belonging and settler colonial settings in both the US and Canada. Um, so genomics has emerged as a powerful and often problematic framework for producing identity and belonging, with increasing implications for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. This includes the now decades-long history of settlers claiming indigenous identifications on the basis of genetic ancestry tests as outlined uh, by Kim Talbert's keynote speech. But genetic claims to indigeneity are also increasingly being incorporated, at least in the US context, into legal claims around identity and group belonging, land and resource use, and repatriation of remains from the collections of DNA researchers and academic institutions, as in the recent decision to repatriate the remains of the ancient one, also known as Kennewick Man, to tribes including the Umatilla in Washington state. So because of these issues, I'd like to begin my talk by taking a deeper look at the kinds of claims that are made in and around commercially available genetic tests. And I know it's early, but this is going to be a lot of genetics, so bear with me. Um, such as companies like 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, and National Geographic's Genographic Project. So to give you an idea of the kind of impact these companies are having, more than 2 million people have already participated in genetic ancestry testing through one of th these three companies alone. Uh, and many thousands more have participated in genetic ancestry testing with one of several dozen other smaller companies. And these companies make a number of really lofty claims about what they can achieve for their growing number of customers uh, using emerging genetic technologies, from helping them reconstruct family roots, determine their geographic origins, ethnic identity, or tribal affiliation, to, locating, to even locating their ancestral village. Complex relations for which there is not now, nor will there ever be a definitive genetic test, as I hope to show here today. So identifying someone's specific ethnicity or tribal affiliation is simply not possible um, using even the most advanced genetic ancestry tests because indigenous or other relations are not now and never will be genetically constituted sets of relations. So I'd like to take a closer look at how these genetic tests work. Traditionally, there have been two primary types of commercially available tests. The first focuses on what's called mitochondrial DNA, shown there on the left, which is a small circular piece of DNA that a person inherits solely from their mother and her from her mother and so on back through history. Um, unlike other portions of the human genome, which we'll talk about later, mitochondrial DNA has a really simple mode of inheritance because it's never combined with the father's DNA. And so it represents just one, uh, it's representative of one's matrilineal descent. And so this has been the historically most widely used genetic test. However, it's really problematic as well because the mitochondrial DNA makes up less than 1% of the human genome, and it only represents a small fraction of a person's ancestry, just one ancestor per generation moving back at any point in the past. In the second most common genetic test, uh, looks at a small portion of the Y chromosome, the so-called sex-determining chromosome, which is passed on from fathers to sons in most cases. Uh, for individuals carrying a Y chromosome, most commonly but not exclusively men, the second genetic test can be used to assess one's patrilineal descent. So similar to the mitochondrial DNA here, this portion of the Y chromosome makes up less than 1% of the human genome and again reflects only one out of many thousands of ancestors, sorry, let's go back, at any one point in the past. So these are the conventional types of genetic tests that have been used, but I'm now going to describe sort of the more updated technology that's now being used to make claims to tribal belonging. So the third type of genetic test analyzes a person's nuclear genome, which includes DNA inherited from the father and the mother, and therefore contains genetic contribution of many different ancestors at any point in the past. <laughs> 
tests including locations of the nuclear genome have proliferated over the last five to seven years or so as technology has improved, becoming the dominant technology for ancestry testing and providing a more detailed, though I argue increasingly chaotic picture of a person's ancestry with increasingly ambiguous meaning. So these tests work by looking at millions of what are called single nucleotide differences in a person's genome. So at any one of these positions, people may have a different DNA letter depending on who they're descended from. So here's a chart just explaining this. For example, at this position in the genome, some people might have a C while others have a T, G, or A, one of the four different letters that make up a DNA sequence. So after a company has determined a customer sequence, I'm just going to give an example from my own DNA and I'm going to continue to do that throughout this talk. After a company has determined a customer's genetic sequence across millions of single nucleotide positions, they compare these results with the same DNA positions from many other individuals that they have stored in their genetic database. And the search and search for those who share matching sequences. So it's just an example of my DNA being matched up with the database. Unlike mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA, where each letter in the sequence is inherited from one ancestor, either the father or the mother, each single nucleotide position shown here may come from a different ancestor in your lineage. So they're each independent. So each can have separate histories of inheritance. Because of this, single nucleotide positions in a person's nuclear DNA may correspond with different people in the database who may be living in different parts, ge different geographic regions around the world. Now, these matches are reliable. They do tell you something about relation, but it's not without its problems. For example, geographic origin is statistically determined for an individual based on where a person with a matching sequence is found at highest frequency. So just to give an example of some of the problems of how this works, let's take a look at my own distribu the distribution of my own mitochondrial lineage. This is my mother's um, uh, mitochondrial lineage which is found at highest frequencies in the Middle East. So this image that you're seeing is called a heat map. Um, so where the darker the color is, the more commonly my DNA sequence is found in that area. So based on this chart, while a genetic test is most likely to locate my ancestors in the Middle East, which is true in the ultimate sense, it's actually much more likely that I inherited this sequence from a much more recent ancestor in the British Isles. So you can see there's some slippage in how DNA is used here and how it locates people uh, in geography. So however, my lineage may have also come from any region in the world, uh, even the ones that are pale pink here where it's found, or regions where it's not found today but was present at some point in the past, because people move around, um, or simply just isn't represented in the company's database because databases are relatively small still. So there's no one to compare me to necessarily. So, so uh, for... This slide shows the distributions of five common maternal lineage that are found in the Americas. This is prior to the arrival of Europeans. Um, groups A, B, C, D, and X, those are the five most common lineages. And as you can see, each of these matter lines can be found in many different populations. So haplogroup A, for example, which is shown in green here in the pie charts, can be found in indigenous groups all the way from the Arctic Circle down to Argentina. So because DNA, sequence are in, DNA sequences are invariably distributed in these kinds of patterns, um, very few, if any of them, are diagnostic of a specific place or specific population and could never be used to assign someone to an indigenous group in particular. So while more sophisticated tests can now narrow the results substantially, and we'll talk about some of that next, there will never be a genetic test for tribal affiliation in particular. In addition, because different companies and institutions use different databases and analyze different parts of the genome, taking tests provided by different scientists provide varying results, and you'll never get the same result twice because of how these databases work. So your actual ancestry, this thing that's written in stone, shifts between different tests that you take. So now we're going to move into the real shit. <clears throat> Buckle in. So for example, there are several different analyses using <laughs> here are several different analyses using a couple of different databases of DNA sequences for inferring ancestry, which includes again some of my own uh, genome results. We'll unpack that in the next few slides. In these images, each block of color here represents a population that's chosen beforehand. So a priori, a genetist decides I'm going to choose these populations and I'm going to compare people to them um, beforehand by the scientist for comparing. Comparison. Now, any number of different populations could be chosen for the analysis. And th in this image, uh, what you see are the results of a program called Admixture. And I'm just going to leave that floating, um, <clears throat> which is used largely by academic scientists to determine genetic ancestry. 
This particular analysis, which is I asked a colleague of mine to run at UT Austin, uses four different source populations, Sub-Saharan Africans, East Asians, Western Europeans, and Native Americans. So each, each vertical line here uh, represents one individual in the population, and the different colors in each vertical line represents the fraction of that person's DNA that they share in common with the other populations that are being used for comparison here. So for, for example, this individual shares all of their DNA in common with indigenous people, which is shown in blue. This person shares some of their DNA with indigenous people and some of it in common with Europeans, so shown in red and blue. And on the far right, we have six individuals, one of whom is me, that we want to estimate genetic ancestry. The in this analysis works by looking at single nucleotide variants for each individual and then predicting which source population that are chosen here that the sequence is shared in common with. It then sorts and color codes the sequences so that you can e uh, estimate the fraction of a person's ancestry that, that derives from different populations. Okay. Okay, so for this analysis, we can see that the last three individuals here, four, five, and six, share all of their DNA sequences with Europeans that were chosen for analysis. The first three individuals, however, share most of their genetic sequences with Europeans, but also share DNA in common with other populations. For example, the first individual shares some genetic sequences in common with Native Americans, shown in blue. This is labeled number one. Sub-Saharan Africans, shown in green, and East Asians, shown, shown in purple. So setting aside, and I'm setting this aside, and I know it's a major setting aside, but I don't have time. Setting aside the sort of obvious racialized ways in which populations have been defined here, and this has been the focus of a lot of people's other work, so I'm going to leave that there. The point that I want to make is that if we change the number and geographic locations of source populations in this analysis, remember I said it changes from analysis to analysis, and if we include different populations in the Europe or the Americas, for example, the results of these ancestry estimations can also change. So we're going to take individual number one here. And we're going to, so there on top is the original analysis for individual one. And then underneath is a new analysis where we've added in Siberians and more Native Americans. So setting, oh, in this image, in the second image there, by including different populations, you notice that East Asians are no longer estimated as a part of that person's ancestry, where a higher fraction of Native American ancestry is predicted. So this has changed because of how we've set up the analysis. Okay, I think that's the worst of it. So this example is intended to show that genetic ancestry testing is highly dependent upon the database used for comparison and the amount of genetic material that's studied. So genetic ancestry results are not written in stone, but change from analysis to analysis and only represent a likelihood of someone's biological relation rather than an exact connection to any one group. Thus, the idea that we can use DNA to link people to discrete populations or discrete landscapes is highly problematic. And while the analysis is able to identify that an, in, that an individual does have indigenous ancestors to some degree, there is no way this test could be used to provide a specific tribal affiliation, again speaking in the context of the US, because that's not how DNA works and that's not how group membership works. So to close my talk, I want to return to this figure I promised it was over, it's not I lie. Um, <clears throat> and use it to highlight some of the issues with claiming indigenous identity and offer some autoethnographical reflections on my own ancestry. Um, some autoethnographical reflections on my own ancestry and the biosocial webs of relating, the ways that I claim and am claimed by people and landscapes that I hope will be useful to bring some of the trouble of ongoing settler possession of indigenous bodies and identities through the logic of DNA into clearer focus. So first, I want to consider the genetic variation among so-called indigenous people represented in this figure. Again, each vertical line here indicates a single individual. The different colors represent the different populations with which someone shares DNA. So as you can see, there's a lot of genetic diversity among the various tribally affiliated people included in this analysis. And to varying degrees, most of them have both European, shown in red, and indigenous, shown in blue, ancestors and sometimes ancestors from other places as well. And this picture of genetic diversity, and I want to underscore this point, this picture of genetic diversity is something that is really only recently coming into focus in population genetics, the implications of which are the basis of some of my ongoing work, as well as others in my lab group who are working under Deborah Bolnick at the University of Texas in Austin. So it might be tempting to looking at these results, and 
not just tempting people say this, um, to see this population as the result of racial mixing between indigenous people and Europeans. But as the 48th person that read Chris's book here, I think this interprets, <laughs> you're welcome, I bought the paperback, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think this would be a mistake. Um, <laughs> so this group is culturally constituted, right? It's linked to particular cultures, histories, and places. And to echo Chris's sentiments, I ask who was ever pure. People move. We have always been moving. Populations are dynamic. And any assertion that we were ever static is a gross oversimplification of human history. Shit changes. I want to now point out that in past genetic studies, only a subset of these individuals would have been included in population history research. And others would have conventionally been omitted from genetic analysis based on their non-indigenous or multi-tribal ancestors. We're only, we're only including those that geneticists presume are genetically pure, shown on the right. So that's all that's appeared in most of population history research about indigenous people is those people. In such historic genetic analyses, only the individuals shown there would have been included, and all of the other tribally affiliated people here who are, who are deemed as unpure, admixed, multi-tribal ancestry would have been left out. So this historical process, and again, I want to underscore this, this and because this underscores a lot of what Kim said uh, the other night, this historical process of scientists making decisions about who counts as indigenous have contributed to the materialization of indigenous bodies such that only certain kinds of DNA sequences and certain bodies have come to be understood as indigenous in science. And these misconceptions about what counts as indigenous are the very foundation on which settler possession of indigenous identities through DNA ancestry testing has unfolded in recent decades. However, when we look at indigenous notions of kinship, when we, sorry, when indigenous notions of kinship and membership are privileged instead of scientific de definitions about who is indigenous, thanks, a very different picture of genetic diversity emerges and one that more clearly centers biosocial webs of relation and undermines the very notion that DNA claims alone can be used to constitute indigenous belonging. So when we look at a group, this group, as constituted by tribal belonging, that includes all people who are tribally affiliated, who claim and are claimed. We see, we see individuals who have mostly indigenous ancestors, others who have both indigenous and non-indigenous ancestors, and still others who have no measurable trace of indigenous DNA as scientifically defined. All nonetheless cohering as indigenous peoples through circles of reciprocal social claiming. It's not that DNA doesn't matter here. DNA is one form of relating that matters because it tells us about some of our relations. But I think we must widen notions of ancestry and inheritance beyond the genome and appreciate all the material and social ways that we inherit our relations, biological, material, social, historical, political, and otherwise. DNA does not own the concept of inheritance. In this view of genetic diversity that exists within indigenous groups, where there is such variation that you can see here among tribally cohered people, again in the context of the US, settler, came, settler claims to indigenous belonging and attempts to possess indigenous cultural patrimony through DNA claims reach their absurd and logical end. If a tribe is not genetically constituted, how can one make genetic claims to membership? DNA should never be viewed in isolation because DNA does not exist apart from social, historical, and political processes. Rather, DNA is embedded in irreducibly worldly contexts and is continually reshaped by social processes. So the genetic diversity seen here then, I think reflects a process of becoming with each other that includes all manner of biosocial relations that, draw, that have drawn people together in this group. So I want to end by showing you the DNA ancestry result of two men. I'll give a little bit of autoethnography here to see how these processes work out. One of them is a tribally affiliated man from this figure who I'll call Dan, and the other one of them is me. Shown here are DNA results side by side. So in a, in a solely genetic sense, Dan and I both have mostly European ancestors and a small fraction of indigenous ancestors shown in blue. Our specific ancestors may or may not actually be in common. We may not have the same grandparents or great-grandparents. Um, but we have very similar genetic ties to populations on the basis of DNA alone. And telling us apart will require a lot more than DNA. It requires making DNA responsible again to other material, social, and political histories that have embedded us in different webs of claiming and being claimed. So I don't know Dan, but I imagine his story is somewhat different from my own. To bystanders, we probably both look like white boys from the South. 
Um, but we inherited very different and layered histories of oppression and, and privilege. Dan likely grew up on a reservation in the southern United States, perhaps moving back, I say that because we actually collected it from tribally affiliated people on reservations. Dan likely grew up on a reservation in the southern United States, perhaps moving back and forth to surrounding cities as his family relocated for work. He grew up as a recognized member of a tribal nation, enmeshed in webs of social and material relations with people and landscapes that together co-constitute him as an indigenous person. He has a history of claiming and being claimed, knowing and being known by indigenous people. His indigenous ancestors are more than just stories or faded photographs. They are beyond mere feelings of being Indian or vague references to high cheekbones as Kim pointed out. He knows those ancestors by name, both living and dead. Their stories and their histories are a part of how he came to be known as indigenous. I grew up in the South too, but not on a reservation. I grew up the eighth, an eighth generation Texan in a family of tenement farmers, cotton pickers, and hard laborers. People who know, I come from people who know and are constituted by their relation to a place, yeah, but in a very different way than Dan's family. Traces of the Blackfoot woman who may be one of my ancestors, my great-great-grandmother, I've been told, survive as shreds of memory. The presence of an old woman my grandmother recalled during the Depression. Old photographs of her children and grandchildren passing references to high cheekbones and other facial fe features down our family line. No fantasy of a Cherokee princess, though. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we're just too poor to dream of royalty, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I do think about my indigenous ancestor. I do think her story and her survival matters because I'm standing right here as a consequence of her and all my ancestors' decisions to live. However fraught that history undoubtedly is, her story matters. Not because it makes me indigenous, because it too is part of the larger workings, and this is the take home, it is part of the larger workings of settler colonialism and all of the complicated trajectories, agencies, and structures that are implicated in it and that brought myself and Dan to entangled but different sides of history in the American South. I was raised by people and in a place that tied me to the legacies of white trash in the South who never failed to understand who they are or the knowledge and values that flow out of those positionalities as people who understand who they are on the margins of whiteness. We are not indigenous people, not because our DNA results confirm or deny those material connections, but because that is not who we collectively became. I share similar DNA results with Dan, but DNA is not enough to capture the full spectrum of material and social relations that differentially tie us to peoples and landscapes of the South. It isn't that DNA isn't important. Neither is it true that DNA is simply imposing material relations over social relations. It's important to understand that material relations are social relations. Social relations are material relations. They're inextricably tied together. So the problem of the epidemic of settler claiming of indigenous bodies and cultural patrimony that is imposing, is imposing settler forms of social relations over other forms of relating. And DNA alone is a poor stand-in for all of the complex material and social relations that inscribe bodies with meaning. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, next, we have uh, Jessica Kolopenik, uh, who's from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And on her mother's side, she descends from Chief Peguis's people, who are Cree and Anishinaabe, uh, from the Red River region uh, north of Winnipeg. Uh, specializing in political theory and indigenous nationhood, Kolopenik is a candid uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Victoria. Her dissertation explores the power generated through science to impose meaning onto the everyday lives of indigenous peoples in Canada, particularly as indigeneity is increasingly reconfigured through genetic sciences and gene talk. Uh, she's going to be presenting a paper called Ancestry, Ge Ancestry Genes and a Colony Chief, Peguis' People and the Red River. Could you all please join me uh, in welcoming Jessica. Good morning. I'm from Winnipeg, as you know. I'm mixed, but no, I'm not Métis. I'm a Treaty 1 Indian and a Bear Clan and Cree descendant of Peguis First Nation. Nitsigason Wapiskif Miguan. On my mother's side, I'm a McCorster and a Spence. Recently, the subfield of Métis studies in academia has in is increasingly coalescing around the work of Dr. Chris Anderson, who critiques the racialization of Métis identity that sees Métisness as being defined through an ancestral, biological, and cultural mixedness, rather than being one of indigenous nationhood. I read Chris's book too, and so should I have. I was, I'm his former student. <laughs> <laughs> 
I didn't buy it, no. <laughs> Anderson writes, quote, Métis are understood as mixed, diluted missives of a deeper and more legitimate indigeneity, namely that of our First Nation ancestors, end quote. Drawing on Anderson's work, Godry and LaRue have also demonstrated how Métisness is easily stolen as an identity by non-Indigenous people, precisely because of the perception that Métis equals mixed. Specifically, they examine, and as we saw yesterday, uh, pop-up Métis groups in Quebec and elsewhere, which have claimed Métis identity by articulating it genetically according to a racialized logic of hypodescent. This logic suggests that one's genes or genetic material contain an embodied inheritance from a long ago indigenous ancestor. Because I study how genetic and genomic science is impacting redefinitions of indigeneity in Canada, Godry and LaRue's identification of the use of genetic testing by these groups to hand out Métinus, so to speak, motivated me to examine Daniels and Pauli to see if Métis identity is also being articulated genetically by Canada or by Métis people themselves in these cases. After reviewing the Daniels decision and case facta, I've found that the language of genetics plays no role in defining Métis identity and its assumed mixedness with First Nations. Furthermore, in Pauli, a Métis person's ancestral connection to a historic Métis community is not limited to genetic descent, but can be proven, quote, by birth, adoption, or by other means, end quote. So while the pre-existing logic of mixedness and hypodescent that has been associated with Métisness has made it easier for pop-up Métis groups to make genetic claims to indigeneity, the genetic articulation of Métisness itself remains isolated from Canadian legal application. Put differently, genetic science and gene talk have not yet colonized juridical understandings of Métis identity, even as groups outside of the juridical field operationalize these logics and practices. My point about genetic science is not intended to say that Métinus was not racialized in Daniels. Scholars like Anderson, Godry, Vowell, LaRue, Adizi, and Todd have already shown that this is one of the outcomes of the case. My point, rather, is that while Métinus was generated yet again as being constituted by racial mixedness, mixedness was not expressed in terms of genetic material. Rather, it was expressed through an older racializing symbol of ancestry. Respectfully, I cite the Daniels' appellant factum, for instance, when they write, quote, it is well established that the term Métis generally refers to mixed ancestry aboriginals with a distinct Métis identity, end quote, meaning that Métis people are the offspring of Indian and European ancestral parentage, but that all people of mixed ancestry are not necessarily Métis. I argue that definitions of Métis identity that rely on a notion of generic or vague ancestral mixedness racialize the indigenous ancestors of Métis people homogeneously as Indians, and it erases the local peoples-based relationships out of which Métis genealogies and communities emerged. I will discuss the history of Peguis' people and the Red River Métis today as one example of these inter-Indigenous peoples-based relationships because it is one that had, I think, a big impact on the emergence of the Métis Nation, of Winnipeg, and of Manitoba, as well as what would become hardened as categories of Indian and half-breed. Anderson has warned that those who define Métinus in terms of mixedness are misrecognizing how they've become invested in race-based thinking, and further that this way of thinking limits the political possibilities of our Indigenous peoplehoods. After all, seeing us as a race rather than as fully formed humans with the capacity for political sovereignty and governance has typically shaped the colonial treatment of Indigenous peoples in Canada. I'm not here to take a position on whether or not people are misrecognizing themselves and their histories. But my research and my personal experience do support Anderson's claim that the racialization of Métis as mixed diverts their indigeneity from the interpeoplehood relationships that largely contributed to the emergence of the Métis nation at Red River, but also of other indigenous groups like my own, 
Pegwa's First Nation, the largest band once at Red River, and the only one which made up and controlled one of the parishes at the Red River settlement. Despite likely kinship shared uh, kinship through shared ancestry between these groups on family levels, the assertions by Peguis' people and the Métis Nation of their political distinctiveness led to their distinct negotiations with the Canadian state in the 19th century, namely those which culminated in the Manitoba Act for the Métis and Treaty 1 for the Anishinaabe and Cree. At one time, Pegwa's First Nation was known as the St. Peter's Band and occupied the region just north of Winnipeg, near present-day Selkirk. We're the largest First Nation in Manitoba, made up of Cree and Anishinaabe peoples. Pegwa's First Nation is named after Chief Pegwis, a Soto man believed to have been born in 1774 around present-day Sault Ste. Marie. In the late 18th century, leading a group of about 200 Soto, Pegwis arrived at the fork of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. They continued up Nipawin, translated as Death River, and also known as Netley Creek. The Cree camps along the river had been reduced by smallpox and warfare with the Sioux. Chief Albert Edward Thompson, the great-great-grandson of Chief Peguis, who served as the chief of Peguis First Nation himself for 18 years, received the oral history of our people passed from Chief Peguis himself to his descendants. Thompson recalls these events. He narrates that Chief Peguis' people came across a little boy, the lone survivor at Nipawin, and adopted him. Peguis then traveled south along the red toward the mouth of the Assiniboine, where he met with Assiniboine chief Ukudoat, whose people had already been living in the area. According to the oral history, it said that the chiefs smoked the pipe and swore allegiance to one another, particularly in mutual support against invading Sioux. In the years to follow, Chief Peguis would become arguably one of the most prominent chiefs in the Red River region and in the city that would become known as Winnipeg. Peguis and his people established a permanent settlement at Let Netley Creek and according to historian Sarah Carter, by 1875 had 2,000 acres of land under cultivation. During the winters, like the Métis, they would travel south and camp at Pemina where they hunted buffalo. And when the Selkirk settlers first arrived from the Orkney Islands in 1812, after their benefactor, Lord Selkirk, had been ceded the district of Assiniboia by the HBC, Peguis and his people welcomed them and offered them support, without which they may not have survived and established themselves as a settlement. Thompson describes that when the first settlers arrived, they had to follow the example of the Indians and join the buffalo hunt some 60 miles south to Pemina. He goes on, quote, the Soto rode their ponies alongside the weary line of settlers walking over the snowy prairies and frozen streams. Our people took pity on the exhausted parents carrying small children and offered to carry them to Pemina. The Scottish people must have been very frightened of losing their children as the warriors and hunters galloped out of sight. Days later, when the distraught parents reached the little village of forts about the Pemina River, they found without exception all the children had been safely delivered. Many of the fathers and mothers repaid the Indians with gifts of jewelry and shawls." End quote. This event is said to have created a strong bond of faith and respect between the Soto and the Selkirk settlers, a perhaps likely and strategic relationship considering that Peguis is believed to have traded exclusively with the Hudson's Bay Company after quarreling with John Wells of the Northwest Company by 1812. Over time, Chief Peguis became a good friend of the settlers. He quickly learned the dates of their festivals, weddings, and baptisms, and with a few favorites of his own band, would journey to the settlement to join in the merriment and feasting. It is said that whenever he imbibed too freely, Peguis liked to tell the Scots that he was going to the fort to frighten the governor. All, all enjoyed the joke and the fact that Peguis called himself the colony chief. Indeed, Peguis did possess relative power at Red River, disposing of St. Peter's parish lands as he saw fit. When tensions erupted between what has become dichotomized as the Selkirk Settlers and Hudson's Bay Company and the Métis and the Northwest Company, Chief Peguis seemingly landed on the side of the Settlers and the HBC. Prior to the Battle of Seven Oaks, along with another chief called Yellow Legs, he attempted to facilitate peace between the settlers and the Métis, and when the Métis refused on more than one occasion, Peguis offered to defend the colony from them. Governor Semple told him not to interfere. 
<laughs> During the battle from the other side of the river, Peguis and his warriors watched the Métis victory at Seven Oaks. Chief Thompson's oral history describes the battle as, quote, a heartless act in which no mercy had been shown the wounded, end quote. The next day, Peguis and his warriors returned to the battleground and collected the bodies on behalf of the Hudson's Bay Company and settlers. Thompson writes, quote, Chief Peguis stood at the burial with tears running down his cheeks. These white men were his friends, end quote. Throughout the years to follow, Chief Peguis continued to refuse to join the Métis and remained close with the Selkirk settlers with the Anglican Church rather than the Catholic one and the Hudson's Bay Company. This friendship was solidified between Lord Selkirk and Peguis in 1817 with the Selkirk Treaty. Amy Kraft describes the Selkirk Treaty as a relationship agreement rooted in a longer tradition of Anishinaabe treaty making that saw these types of relationships as facilitating peace necessary for sustenance and survival. From an Anishinaabe perspective, the Selkirk Treaty was an agreement of annual rent, not one of permanent sale. And while the HBC and the Anishinaabe would disagree about this meaning, Peguis remained friends with Lord Selkirk, even warning him in 1817 that, quote, the half-breeds have plotted to kill you. They asked me to bring a bag of pemmican to their place of ambush, but I refused and told them that I would prevent this killing, end quote. Peguis' son and successor, Miskukaneo, Red Eagle, or Henry Prince, would also refuse to join the Métis on the eve of Manitoba's entry into Confederation. Thompson recalls, Chief Henry Prince met with Riel on more than one occasion and voiced his disapproval of the Métis behavior. He was particularly annoyed when Riel called a general meeting, and this would have been the Convention of 24, and refused to allow his speech in French to be translated into Cree. Out of fear that the Comité National would take their lands at Red River, Henry Prince sided with the Anglophone Canadian Party. By March 1870, it is recorded in Alex Alexander Begg's journal that, quote, the Indians in and around the Indian settlement of St. Peter's are very much discontented and declare that if the French are not out of Fort Garry by the spring, they will attack them, end quote. During the Red River resistance, Peguis's band did not claim the Métis they did not claim each other. After, the, after negotiating uh, the Manitoba Act, the next year in 1871, Henry Prince would join others in signing tr Treaty 1. At the commencement of Treaty 1 negotiations, Henry Prince recalled his loyalty to the Queen and recounted his refusal to participate in the Red River resistance the pre previous year. Prince said, quote, my people had nothing to do with it and no dark-skinned man had anything, whatever, to do with it." End quote. And although the Indian Act and script policies that would follow hardened the administrative groupings of Indian and half-breed, it is not entirely accurate to say that colonial categorization made us into distinct political entities. We had already been acting as such for years due to our own choices of political association and refusal. The legacy of Chief Peguis's friendship with the Selkirk settlers would eventually be betrayed through Western colonization, the Indian Act, and an illegal land surrender of the St. Peter's Reserve in 1907, in which the Canadian government created a new reserve for our First Nation, about 200 kilometers north of Winnipeg. One of my family stories tells of the long trip endured by my great-grandfather and others to the new reserve, in, uh, which would only culminate in being greeted by muskeg and mosquitoes. Many of my family members now purchase or rent private property in Selkirk and St. Andrews in order to be in closer proximity to the economic opportunities of the city, but also, as my auntie says, to live at home. Despite Peguis and his descendants' influence in the area on the eve of the birth of the city of Winnipeg and the province of Manitoba, scholarship has seemed to nearly all but leave him, him and our people out of consideration when narrating accounts of Red River history. What if Peguis had not helped the Selkirk set settlers? What if him and his people had joined the Métis in driving them out? Would the history of Manitoba and even of Confederation have looked differently? An examination of Peguis's people reveals a history of tense inter-peoplehood relationships, not just between Indigenous peoples and the non-Indigenous colonizers, but between Indigenous groups themselves as colonial interferences would put pressure on everyone to make decisions about the relationships that they thought would most benefit their people.
And what about Métis definitions of mixed ancestry? Innes has shown that bands on the Northwestern Plains have virtually always been multicultural and inclusive of Nehiaupuat or Iron Alliance members, Cree, Soto, Assiniboine, and Métis, but this framing cannot completely explain the relationship between Pegwa's First Nation and the Métis Nation, particularly in the latter part of the 19th century. Relationships established through the political technology of kinship at Red River cannot be reduced to logics of shared ancestry, as Peguis and Henry Prince consistently sided with non-Indigenous Anglophones against the Métis, even if they were cousins. And further configurations of Métis as mixed erase the complex interrelationships, forces, and political choices that gave shape to the distinct peoples we now exist as. Not racializing Peguis and Métis peoples means seeing kinship in the Red River area as not only determined by the biological shared ancestry between these groups, but also by the relationships they respectively formed with different fur trade companies and European powers. When claims to Métisness rest on generically invoked mixed ancestry with Indian ancestors, there needs to be more specific reference to who they are claiming kin with, because our shared ancestry has not always meant that we've acted like family. This doesn't mean that we never will, but it does mean that we still have some work to do. Thank you. Uh, so we've heard from this wonderfully uh, diverse panel, um, and we have time for a couple of questions if people uh, if people have them. Reach it to it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, delegates, Good morning. elders. Uh, Jack Bushy, Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement. Uh, Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement. Uh, Kinship, it surely invokes a thought of togetherness and and uh, how we come together. You know, we have Lake Santan here. We have many celebrations that we all gather, uh, maybe as families, but as friends also that we may not see. Um, as an elected official within the confines of Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement, we are governed by statutes. We are governed by laws, and we we're governed by a Métis Settlement Act and. Uh, we have people, you know, instead of like long time ago, you were just accepted into the community by the community itself. Unfortunately, it has changed to a political uh, sphere where we have to look at a piece of paper and decide whether if you were to apply for a membership today in Buffalo Lake, I would look at your history that you provided and also with the um, application paperwork that we have to determine whether you can be a Métis Selman member. And sometimes it doesn't work in the applicant's favor and so my question to you, to, and I, I would like for Harold to answer this here because he's, he's been involved with it for a lot of years, is, is what happens after we, at, at the settlement level, say no to a person that has applied for membership in the Métis settlement. And I think it's only fair that other people that don't know about Métis settlements should hear that. Thank you. If, if you're at liberty to talk about it. Oh, probably not, but I'll talk about it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have uh, a negotiated uh, legislative framework in which to address that question. I think what's happening now is the way the legislation is framed, it requires um, that those who are applying prove Métis identity. That's, that's the heading, proving Métis identity. And I think there are many who um, can and do prove their Métis identity. However, there's a different framework that gets overlaid on top of that, which is social economic and not just around identity. And I think decisions are made locally based on, you know, how much land is there, how much money is there, uh, that isn't necessarily reflected in the way that the legislation is currently drafted. I think there's an opportunity to do more under our self-governance system to perhaps include those types of decision uh, uh, those, those types of factors into the decision, a, decision making locally. It's not there yet, which means that some people who are uh, declined from membership, I think, feel uh, that they're being told they're not Métis. And our legislation hasn't evolved to the point yet uh, 
where a rejection of one's application isn't a rejection of their Métis-ness, if I can put it that way. So there's still work to do, uh, but fortunately, uh, through, I think, conferences and negotiations, there's an opportunity to grow that legislation and make it a bit more sophisticated so that the decisions that need to be made locally that include, you know, questions of what resources are available is separated or at least added to the question of who in fact is Métis, that you can recognize mm -hmm. someone as Métis, but simply, you know, come to the other decision that needs to be made around, uh, around resources as well. So I hope that addresses your question. I was kind of talking about, like, there's only three requirements, basically, that you have to be Métis, live in Alberta for five years, and be over 18 to satisfy the, the basic need. But it's, the issue is coming to fort now in which people from outside of Alberta are applying to the settlements, and how do we uh, identify that they are Métis? Where do we turn to? That's, those are some of the issues that we have faced as a governing body. And, sorry. Maybe uh, you can just what I said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, sorry, I don't want to mon monopolize the uh, discussion, but it really is, I mean, the question is, uh, for those applying from outside of Alberta, for example, uh, let's say someone has uh, moved here, there is a five-year residency requirement and there are, it's, it's a bit more detailed in terms of proving Métis identity, Section 74 and 78 of the Métis Settlements Act, if you have a chance to look at it. That speaks to having to bring certain things before a council to enable a council to make a decision, including, for example, declarations uh, of recognized elders, uh, one's um, family history, and, you know, how it is that one identifies not only as Métis, but also, you know, with the community that uh, one is applying to. So there is an opportunity for a more involved discussion, uh, I, uh, I think. But it, it needs to, I think, uh, be grown perhaps through a general counsel policy to allow those other decisions uh, that go beyond simply proving Métis identity, that allow a community to manage its resources, um, that the General Council has that opportunity to provide that framework for all Métis settlements. Hello, uh, Walter from Grand Prairie. Um, Rick, I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about your presentation and, uh, you know, where you live and where you, where you got your, you know, your information and that kind of thing. Um, you now have a new president down there, and uh, there's a scientific method uh, that people could potentially use in some political political means. Now, I wondered what you could, what, you know, what what sort of what kind of probabilities would there be for, um, uh, say, the American government to start using methods such as these to class who's a member of a, a given ethnic group or racial group or what? Like we got all kinds of new faces down there. What do you think? Well, um, yeah, I mean, so th this part of genetics cannot be separated from a certain history of eugenic thinking. I mean, genetics flows directly out of thinking about populations in very racialized ways, um, linking culture and biology and behavior together in particular ways. So I, that, that type of thinking isn't substantiated by a lot of the biology that's been doing now, but do I imagine that we could end up in a future where people are discriminated on the basis of their DNA? Yes, because we come from a past where people have been discriminated upon the basis of their DNA. So I, I won't speculate about where that could go because I don't know, but um, I think the implications are, that you mentioned are real concerns. So just to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I know you've spoken in, uh, in quite in, in length about probabilities and, yes. you know, mm -hmm. and samples and that kind of thing. You know, what do you, what do you think are there, if you could just boil it down to maybe, a, a, what's, the, what's the probability of, um, of, a, of an individual having to find, uh, to, you know, if he takes a DNA test, what's the probabilities of them being able to r really prove their... Um, indigenous heritage. Yeah, I mean that it's a different question for each tribe, right? I mean, I, in the U.S. context, like whether or not these are recognized um, means of claiming identity is is a very 
is diversely treated in different groups, right? Some people value this more than others, and it's probably more of a question more for Kim than me. Um, but but I can't give a particular probability. I don't think anyone's looked at that specific question um, of how it could be incorporated, because I think it's going to be really diverse around how different groups use this and ascribe meaning to it. I think my goal was to show like DNA alone isn't sufficient, right? There's other kinds of historical and political and social belonging that must be looked at too um, to contextualize the DNA. The DNA just does not stand alone. So I leave that up to like not being an indigenous person, I leave that up to tribal governments to work out for themselves. One, one particular thing you said to me is that uh, the tests, when repeated, don't necessarily give the same results. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, are there any, uh, 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 how much of, error, of an error is there? Is it 50% uh, wrong or Well, in the one example, so it depends. It depends on the test. So in the example that I gave, you had a person who had indigenous African and Asian ancestry as defined by the test. Again, these racial categories are defined by scientists and re-inscribed racials racial categories, but as defined in the, set, in the test, the person's Asian ancestry, I point to that example, completely disappeared, right? That person no longer had Asian ancestors under the test and had a, an equal proportion more of native ancestors. So it can change test by test. There, there are a few people who I think are looking at discrepancies between like 23andMe versus ancestry DNA versus, um, but the variance between them isn't well characterized. We just know that there is variance between them. Well, one of the reoccurring themes that we've heard here during yeah. these last couple of days is uh, having the Métis people define who they, who they are mm -hmm. and the various questions that have been discussed here in the forum over the last couple of days. You know, I, I, I kind of, um, uh, I'm afraid of the day if we get a, uh, we get a, oh, we get a, a right-leaning government in, the, in Parliament and then they start uh, making up our own membership by their own yeah. criteria. Yeah. And uh, and I know here in Alberta, they, you know, they weren't uh, they weren't above sterilizing, sterilizing people uh, not even uh, 30, 40 years ago, right. when they thought they you know, they they needed to do that. So um, you know, your research is really uh, really good. I really appreciate that you've come you. here to tell us about your work, and uh, this should be a heads up for for us in the Métis Nation that we better settle on this question of uh, of our of our own membership and our own identity. Better work on work. Continue to work on that as hard as we can. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is our third day, and I've enjoyed listening to all these these young people that were sent here. Uh, I just want to relate this back in the in the early '60s. Uh, the old timers. Uh, that's a time when the old timer was. Uh, there was a board of directors of the Métis Nation. The one that had the highest education was Stan Daniels. He had grade eight. <laughs> now we got these university professors and everything, and I'm just chuckling to myself, where the heck were they when we needed them, you know? <laughs> I think one of the exciting things about coming here is hearing the other side, the, the, the smart guys, because I'm always listening to the people up north, the old timers and nothing like that. But uh, I think there's, there's not much difference. I think they have uh, information that you guys should be hearing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention something that you guys, we've been talking about for three days here, try to identify with the Métis people. I, in my lifetime, I've identified with three different kind of half-breeds, and I'll tell you why. One, there's an Indian half-breed, and then there's that half-breed right in the middle, and then there's the white half-breed. And you look around here, you'll see a lot of white half-breeds. And, uh, and the Indian half-breeds are like me. We look Indian and yet we're half-breeds. And the, the other thing, there's a lot of reasons I'm saying this because uh, when you live in a country, we all identify with each other. A lot of the things we talk about the First Nation people because they were institutionalized from day one. The day they signed the treaty, they actually put themselves in jail. They institutionalized themselves under the Indian Act, therefore residential schools, reserves, and all that all these years. Let's put that in perspective, okay? And I'll tell you why. It was the Métis people who kept that tradition and language and culture alive for them in many ways because we weren't influenced by the, by the, the, by the residential schools and all that European training. As a matter of fact, I can prove that in Lac La Biche. Of all the, there's four reserves right, right around Lac La Biche there, and in the school there, they're teaching Cree. Guess what? They have a half-breed guy teaching Cree, and he's sitting right here. 
He speaks that language. Both him and I speak the language very fluently. And we help. We both, we both do that. But what I'm trying to say is, well, I think not enough credit is being given to us as Métis people. We have been helping the First Nation people all our lives. All our lives. We've been there. And you know what? Some of you might not have the same relationship you had, because my, my, my mother was First Nation. And she did everything to try and to prove, to show us how, what it was like to be First Nation, the culture, the whole nine yards. And I don't know how many guys here are spiritual, and I noticed that you guys were all referring to the history and everything. And I know when you're te being taught here, everything is based on, the, on Christianity. If you look at the Bible, that's why you swear on the Bible, Robin. When you, when you go to court, you swear on the Bible, I swear, blah, blah, blah. Because that's where the laws and all that come from. But not one of you guys talked about spirituality. Not one. I never heard one of you guys talk about it. And you're going on and on and telling me, yeah, this is right or wrong. I don't believe you guys half the time. So I do respect you guys for what you did, though. <laughs> you went and accomplished what you went and did. The other thing is that um, I'm a spiritualist. I, I go to a lot of spiritual functions all over the country. And today, I don't know how many guys do that, but there are more half-breeds that practice spirituality than there is First Nation people. Because they've been, you know, they've been under Christianity from day one. And a lot of them lost their spirituality because, because they've been in residential schools and they came out and there was nothing there anymore. So that's why I say that, matter of fact, the guy I go see all the time is a Métis person. He's very spiritual. And I think these things are important because all of that spirituality was, if you want to learn Cree, you have to speak the language. You have to be spiritual because that's where the language comes from. It's a spiritual language. So. I think by doing that, you understand a lot of the relationship that happens between people. And the reason I say to you guys is that if you go to a powwow and you see these people dancing and you automatically assume that they're all First Nation, they're not. They're not. A lot of them are Métis people dancing out there, practicing their Indian culture. It's not just Métis culture we practice. I practice a lot of First Nation culture, if you want to call it that. I speak the language, I know the culture, I know the tradition, the values, because my mother left me them. And on the other side, my father made me the half-breed that I am today. So I'm one of those half-breeds you call right in the middle there. The white half-breeds are the other ones that, uh, they, they, but that's the, that's the good part of being the, being the Métis. You can act Indian as you want. You can act white as all you want, too. And who the heck is gonna stop you if you do that? I sometimes catch myself acting white too, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's the truth. And, and, and the funny thing is that that's why I say, you know, a lot of, a lot of my relatives are, you know, they kind of left the Indian side and they, the only time they want to be half breed and when they want to go to a function, you'll notice them, they put on their buckskin jacket, they put on their sash and try to look Indian. I get a kick out of that. I say, you don't have to do that. We know who you are. But I think the... <laughs> <laughs> But I think the important thing is to understand, we as Métis people, those of us that are called Métis, we have lived on both sides of the world. Somebody called me a thorn one time, and I said, why are you calling me? You're a thorn between the Indians and the whites, he said. You're right in the middle there. And we are. We, we can practice either side. And, uh, and I understand both sides. I speak both languages. I speak Cree very fluently as well. And so I practice both cultures. So. I think this is what I'm trying to refer to you guys. I wish there was more elders here, and I know there's some elders here. I wish you guys would have bought more elders in the north and get you guys to make sure that you guys are doing right. You know, I'm not taking nothing away from you guys. I admire you guys for going to school and, and accomplishing this. But, but I think somehow when I hear you talking, these guys are missing a few things here. You're, you're not really telling what it feels like to really practice it and act, uh, actually do it from day to day. And that's what I want to leave with you guys. But in the meantime, um, I w I, you know, when I was standing here, I was trying to hear somebody say, uh, you know, if you're going to identify, I can identify myself as a Christian. I'm not taking nothing away from the Christianity. I think it works, and I think millions of people use it all over the world. But we as Aboriginal people, I turned to spirituality when I was a kid when my grandmother raised me because it made more sense than trying to understand the other understood kind because my culture, my tradition, my values were in there.
so that I was able to understand a heck of a lot more than trying to follow the Christian road. Because I can, when I started reading the Bible, I said, this guy was lost for 40 years in the desert. I said, how the hell did he survive wandering out there? And I said, that's a little too much for me, you know. <laughs> so I think in a lot of ways, folks, you know, we have to stop and think, when we are Métis, we don't just come up there looking like that. We do have a culture, we do have tradition, values, and standards, and that's how we survive. And I, I continue to urge you guys to keep on doing, but I do want to urge you guys, if you're going to do all this, don't forget us guys out there. We know a lot, but you guys don't know that. A lot of elders up north, wherever I go, I meet elders and they ask me, I heard you went to university to go listen to it, and I'm going to be hearing that when I get home. Come and talk to us. And I will. I'll be talking to them. I'm, going, I'm the messenger, you guys. I'm the messenger. I'm the one I come and listen to you guys. And you can't get away with it. I'll tell the truth. Believe me. <laughs> so, in any event, uh, this will be my last day here, but I've enjoyed the last couple of days. and. Uh, uh, listen to you guys. It, it's the other side of the world for us because we, we're in a different world, you guys. Believe me, you guys are in a whole different world. You're not with us out here, really. And uh, hopefully one day when you guys decide we should meet again, and, uh, but make sure you invite some elders so that they can come and share that, their knowledge with you guys. And, uh, and again, I thank all your good speakers and, uh, and uh, I'll go home and uh, tell the people what I heard here. It's been some good things and I enjoyed it. Hi, hi, merci. Where do you, I think this is on? And Mike, can you hear that? Oh, there we go. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone for setting up this conference. It's been a pleasure to hear everyone's perspectives. Um, my, myself, I am Darcy McCrae. I'm a direct descendant of Duncan McCrae, who will go back in through the history of all Métis people, and I'll pr provide a few samples of that. Uh, the one thing I do want to immediately make note of is, in this Truth and Reconciliation, it seems like we're jumping to the reconciliation, and we're not looking back at the truth. And the truth is, we have a documented history of our ancestors. We can go back on census and see where each and every one of us originated, what properties our ancestors were originally on. And we could reconfigure those communities to their original point in time prior to the colonization. So I'm advocating that we do some study or research on that and look at how things actually evolved truthfully. That's one of my points. Second point being, and indicating that I'm a direct descendant of Duncan McRae, for anyone who does not know who that is, uh, Manitoba was brought into Confederation in the Upper Fort Gary building. The only thing standing there to today is a gate, the stone gate, and that is what my ancestor built. So Manitoba was brought into Confederation into a building that he had built. Go further up the river, you then get to Lower Fort Gary, which is another facility he built, and that is where Treaty 1 got signed. He also went a little bit further up onto the St. Peter's Reserve and built the St. Peter's Church, which was referred to in Jessica's presentation. Um, so these connections, I, I'm not pointing that out to brag or anything, it's just showing that our lineages go back and it predates the Hudson's Bay Company in that area. And we can do it. I will do it. If somebody gives me the support, I will go back and do the, the work. Um, some of the other things that came up for me today uh, is the acknowledgement of our Aboriginal blood. Everyone wants to jump onto the European track and say, okay, well, you're European, so you've been 200 years, which totally negates our Aboriginal blood. No matter what bloodline, whether it's Cree or Soto, or our blood goes back in this country from time immemorial, same as First Nation. And that's something that no one really wants to look at or recognize. Um, the other thing about being Métis, and some people I've heard say, oh, Métis is just a common recent term that gets used. If you go back and look at the 1870 census of Manitoba, there's actually a column that says Métis. Métis has been in use since then and previous. And if you then go to the very next census, the census of Canada, which is in 1871, 
they didn't even bring the 1870 census to include it, even though we were already a member of Confederation. So if you look at those two things, it's pretty apparent they just didn't want to have another document or another record which would totally identify all the original Métis people of that community. So those are just some little things that, uh, that I've picked up on through, through my research and looking at things uh, that don't get discussed a lot. Talking about the warring factions and the different people, we had a, people going back and forth across the country mapping it out for over 60 years, David Thompson being an example of that. Well, he did that with his wife, Charlotte Small, who is a Métis woman. And these explorers, as they're titled by the colonists, to me, were really nothing more than tourists. They had guides. They had people show them. They'd show them, well, here's what is, you got anything that looks like this? Show them a piece of gold? Yeah, we'll take you to where that is. Show them another resource? Take them to where that is. They were tourists. Just want to get that out there. Um, Again, I, I did come across the, the DNA piece, and the only reason we are here is because of our ancestors. I don't care where you moved or what you did. We are blood to blood to blood from our ancestors. So whether you picked up the language or the culture is irrelevant. It is that you are descended by your ancestors. And part of the truth that I'm referring to is when Manitoba was being brought into Confederation, the government actually sent in an army force, the Red River Expeditionary Force, and under military presence and physical abuse and traumas, the Métis people had to hide their identity. That is a truth. That is why we're so many generations into this, that people who are truly of Métis descent do not even know that because of their intergenerational denials. And, and that's something that's got to be corrected. We don't need to worry about how do we do membership, how do we do that. All we do is go back to those original censuses, turn it around, come forward, and we can identify every single person of Métis descent in this country. Then, if we do it similarly to the organ transplant issue, which we just recently adopted, which my wife has advocated for years, we should all be donors, and if you choose not to be, then you can opt out. That is my suggestion for a Métis registry. We re-identify everyone of Métis descent. If they choose that they do not want to be recognized, they can opt out. That's how we will get our membership in place. It will also show how much of us as Métis people have continued to develop this country we developed this country before it was a country. If we go back on the original fur trade route, which is the number 16 highway, the Yellowhead Highway, is named after Métis person, because that is, was the main fur trade route, with branches feeding off of that to trade with the First Nation groups. In any event, I could have taken up all these days bringing all this different information uh, to your attention, and I would. I actually work for an organization, Métis Calgary Family Services. We will provide training to anyone who's willing to receive it. Um, that is an outstanding offer for ever. And uh, I, again, I could go on and on. I feel I'm taking up a lot of time here, so I'll cut it off there, but uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we are all out of time for this panel, um, so we can't take any more questions. We're already uh, like 20 minutes into our break.